Welcome to the Grantland Basketball Hour, presented by the U.S. Postal Service. Here's Bill and Jalen. Welcome to the show, Jalen Rose, as always. And we're making Kobe Bryant just, you're just our co-host for the show. We're cool just folding you into our universe. I'm cool with that. We can promote your documentary later. It's coming out on Showtime, but yeah, right I'm, now... I'm just here kicking it with you guys. Man. I want to talk hoops. You've done this a little bit. You did a couple TNT appearances. Yeah, I have. All yeah. right, so I want to talk Russell Westbrook first. Mm -hmm. All three of us have something in common. We all love watching Russell Westbrook. I look at that Oklahoma City team, and I think to myself, they've been in the fishbowl for a while. Mm -hmm. People are picking them apart, pressure day after day after day. Do you feel, you've been in that fishbowl, you were in there with Shaq in the early 2000s. What's it like to be in there day after day after day and people going like this at you? I, honestly, I, you don't realize it much. And I, don't, I don't think Russell pays much attention to it. I do, you know, because you have your blinders on and you're completely focused on what your team needs and what you have to do to help that team be successful. So you don't really realize how much people are talking about, how much people are poking at it, right? You know it's there. But that's not your focus. But in social media now, it's a little different, right? Like, all these guys check their Twitter replies. They, yeah. And in 2000, you probably didn't know everything everyone was saying about sure. you. And now, don't you, aren't you more sure. aware of what people are more, saying? More conscious of it, yes. But, but at the same time, you know, Russell, uh, I believe, has the same mentality that I have and had, which is it doesn't matter. <laughs> right. Right. Because I'm going to go out here and play hard regardless of what they say, which is a very different mentality to have. What, what, do you about, see? what about the dynamic of Russell playing with KD, a reigning MVP? Now he's an all-star game MVP. Mm -hmm. I parallel that to you playing with Shaq. Right. As you came into your own, he was an MVP. You became a finals MVP and right. a champion. But the difference is the last five minutes of the game, right. he couldn't shoot free throws. Right. So you, we all knew you Kobe, were going to get the ball. Kobe knows that, by the way. What right. about that <laughs> dynamic and them trying to figure that out? Well, I mean, it's, it's good for the team to have consistency so you know who that player is going to be because you have the responsibility and the team knows who's responsible for delivering down the stretch. So it's good to have that ironed out. I think, um, you know, with you know, in Russell and KD's instance, there are certain things that um, Russell does better than KD and, and vice versa. I think Russell's demeanor, I think his, his aggression is what the DNA of the team should be. I mean, he's just aggressive all the time, right? But I think KD's skill to be able to get whatever shot he wants, get to the free throw line, shoot a high percentage, down the stretch, is what his core strength sh should be. Is it fair to say, yeah, I mean, you've probably never said this publicly, but I know you like certain players. Is Westbrook kind of the successor to you from this respect? The most competitive guy game after game after game, like he just wants it the most. He's put on the court that's always thinking about it. He just wants to win. He wants to rip the other teams out. How much of yourself do you see in him? Oh, in, in, in approach to the game, uh, 100%. I mean, he's, he's aggressive and he's unapologetic about it. Right. <laughs> you know, at the same time, the other two guys around the league that, that um, have similar skills in terms of being able to shoot the long ball, mid-range, post up, you know, James Harden, yeah. um, Clay Thompson. I mean, there's some two guards around the league now that are you really starting to see um, develop all aspects of the game. Jalen, Westbrook and Kobe, compare and contrast. That's why I affectionately call Russell Westbrook Furious Styles. <laughs> that was like a young Kobe Bryant. He had the fire in his eyes that if the team isn't going to get it done, then I'm going to take over. And unfortunately for me, I was there game four, 2000. I felt like you came into your own. You won the first two games. We won game three. And all of a sudden, we in game four, and Shaq fouls out in overtime. You make the big time shot, you tell everybody, cool down, get down or lay down, I got this. That, do you feel like that was your coming out moment? Yeah, it, it, it was. I mean, it, you know, I, I didn't realize it at the time. At the time, it just felt like I was just playing basketball. Like, I had worked on that pull-up shot all summer, you know? So it just felt like I was in the gym again by myself, just doing what I've been trained to do, for, you know, shot that I've taken thousands and thousands of times. Um, but for us, even during that team, during, the, during those eras, um, I was the taskmaster. Right? So I was driving the team. I was bringing out that emotion, that aggression, right? By any means necessary. So this you wasn't champagneing and campaigning with the other guys. You was no, driving man, the stake into the absolutely. pat on the back or kicking the butt. No, I was kicking them in the butt all the time, right? And Shaq and I played off of each other that way. I mean, he was a guy that was um, you know, putting his arm around teammates and um, you know, so it's a bad cop, good cop thing then, it sounds yeah, like. Yeah, but we didn't, I mean, in hindsight, that's what it 
that's what it was. I mean, right. during the period, during that time, that was just naturally who we are. Um, but at the same time, man, Shaq had a lot of dog in him. Right? I mean, he'd rip your head off right. in order to win. And uh, you know, that's something that we shared. So Westbrook and Durant are buddies. You and Shaq were co-workers. Right. I don't think you were ever buddies. Does it even matter? No. Doesn't. Not even a little bit. Were you I mean, it makes the environment more enjoyable when you're getting along with somebody. Right. Um, but at the end of the day, if, if you have the respect of each other to go out and perform, you know, that should trump having a great friendship. So in other words, you can be great friends with somebody on a team, not win anything. But you were great friends. And you all could sit back 50 years from now and enjoy the fact that you got along extremely well. We went out to dinner and had fun. Or you can have a combative relationship, win championships, and then sit back 50 years from, from then as friends and be able to talk about all the championships that you've won. And I'd much rather have the latter. And that's why both of you guys are two of the, in anybody, on anybody's list, two of the top 10 players. Because he probably enjoyed winning that championship in Miami without you as much as you enjoyed winning your two in L.A. without him. Yeah, but I got two, though. <laughs> <laughs> Not competitive at all. Why do you have to bring up the 2010 finals? I wasn't ready to talk about that yet. <laughs> yeah, you have no, one I mean, of my rings. <laughs> yeah, well, you have one of mine, too. Right? <laughs> Which so, one? Well, 2000 and, uh, 2008. Oh, stop I mean, that, that it. Should have been, that should have been ours. Stop it. <laughs> that should have been ours. Come on. Uh, with Shaq. I once wrote that he was like the guy in college who could have gotten the 4-0 mm -hmm. and done a whole bunch of awesome stuff in college but mm -hmm. worked his butt off and not really had that much fun. Mm -hmm. Or he could have been the guy who graduated with a 3-6 and had an awesome time and was out four nights a week and had Do you think that's a fair comparison for what, what his potential was? Yeah, well, you know, it's, uh, it's tough. I mean, because the guy at that size with that kind of agility there's certain things that, certain, certain, uh, there's a certain amount of stress that you put on your body to be mm. able to do those sorts of things. So in the latter portions of his career, um, a lot of it was uh, some of the physical challenges that were catching up to him. People yanking his shoulders, all right. that I mean, stuff. Or that sniper in the building that time he's running down the floor in Boston. Right. So those, thing, those things happen, oh, yeah, man. Yeah. Listen, a guy at that size <laughs> being able to move that way is tough. That stress catches up. Yeah. Um, but earlier in his career, I man, 2000, I mean, you saw him that whole summer. He trained like crazy. He watched what he ate, and he had a monster year. Right. Right. So could his focus and commitment uh, been there even more so? Yeah, absolutely. He probably could have led the league in scoring and rebounds and blocks every single year of his career. And I think that dynamic started to change as somebody that was working in the media in the 2004 finals and playing in the league, how in the offseason, instead of basically getting surgery, Shaq opted to say, basically, I got hurt on company right, time, right. so I'm going to rehab on company time. <laughs> right, right. You didn't like that. No, I answered too well with me. <laughs> I answered too well with me. Because, you know, I'm out there <laughs> killing myself in the summertime trying to get ready, you know, and then you can't, don't do that. Don't do that. And then come back and complain about not getting the ball. You can't. In, that don't work for me. In retrospect, you might, it must have been, I mean, you can talk about it now. It was a million years ago. But mm -hmm. it must have been like torture for you because you're working nonstop on your game. And you're, as, is, as your documentary points out, you're just obsessed with basketball. Right. Like that's literally that you just were so driven thing. to be great at it. And then you watch Shaq and he's the opposite. And yet you guys are aligned anyway. And yeah. like just... With a little distance, it makes more sense to me why you guys clash. Well, yeah, I mean, but look, it, it was it was a choice that I made. Like I could have gone to another team, and and the Clippers did my still, individual. Clipper thing. fans are still talking about that. Well, well, it is what it is. I mean, they, they stole another player from us down the road. True, so it all CP3. evens out. Um, but I could I could have done something on my own, <laughs> man. And I made the decision to stay and and, yeah. and try to win with the group that we had. And um, so I, I was fine with that. Do you feel like uh, I'm stepping on a segment that we were gonna do later, but? The window with Oklahoma City, mm -hmm. and I've been writing about this for the last couple of years. They made the 2012 finals. Everybody's like, oh, they're back. They're going to own the decade. And they haven't been back since. And now Durant's limping around. Well, and you had that same kind of window with the Lakers, right? Yeah. Where at one point everybody thought, oh, yeah, that they got the decade. And then yeah. all of a sudden it's over. Yeah, well, time goes by really, really quickly. Um, Dog years. Yeah, it's, it's it, it, you know, <laughs> it goes by fast. But it hurts them, you know, with the cap restrictions to not be able to keep James Harden. Well, they could have kept them. But it, but it, but then you have to lose Ibaka. Right. Right. So you got to make choices. So you, you draft extremely well. You develop these incredible young players. But then you got to make a choice and lose them. 
right? It's got to be one or the other. And, and that, that set them back, man. If you were on that team and you, and, they, and you just lose James Harden, and you know he's one of your best players and you lose him for whatever reasons, like, at what point do you just move on from that mentally and say, you know what, he's gone. This is the team we oh, have. You Let's have go. To. Or do you think about it? Like, he's the MVP these candidate MV right now. But these MVP candidate guys think way different. Yeah. They're thinking it's more opportunity for me to show I can lead mm -hmm. and be great. Sure, sure. You know, at the same time, you, you lose a piece that's invaluable, right? Yeah. So now you have to figure out how to replace that, how to make that up. You know, and it's, uh, it's, it's not easy, man. Well, what was your reaction? You're on the Lakers. You're still a contender at that point. Um, Harden gets traded. This is a team you have to go against. Yeah. Are you relieved? Are you Absolutely. excited? Absolutely. Because we lost the series that we lost against him. We lost because of James. Yeah. We had nobody that could match up with him. Nobody. I mean, he was the problem for us and uh, created so much balance because he was such a great facilitator. So it enabled Russell to be Russell and KD to be, be KD. Right. And uh, he was a matchup nightmare for us. Jalen loved you, him because he's a lefty. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and you talked again about Harden's ball handling ability. And early you referred to Westbrook in the comparison to the shooting guards. Mm -hmm. Now, I always talk about, you know, positions were created so a novice can follow the game. Sure. But is that how you see Russell? Just as a, a basketball player that happens to play guard? Yeah, you, know, you have to because he can do so many things. So you can't just pigeonhole him and say, oh, he needs to be... John Stockton. He well, he shoots CP, too much. Or, or, right. He's not John Stockton. He's not CP. He's Russell. <laughs> right? So you have to let him be him instead of trying to put him in a cage. Right? You have to unleash him and help, and, and help him understand how to be him in a way that benefits the group. When you watch him and you watch Durant, and they, they've never really solved whose team that is, I kind of feel like it's become Westbrook's team. It's crazy to say that because Durant won the MVP last year, but Westbrook's force of personality now is the dominant force of personality, and you were the same way. Do you see that when you're watching them? Yeah, I don't. I have a hard time with understanding like the the, the those, those kind of conversations. Like, you know, oh, explain like whose team it is. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah I, preach. So that, you think that's a media that, thing? That's a media thing. Who's I'm, Batman? I'm happy to be who's the media guy. Robin? Oh, LeBron going to play on D-Wade's team. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I've never. <laughs> what else would I write about? <laughs> yeah, no, because I mean, if you think about it. You, you know, the irony is you, we want players to be unselfish. We want them to be a part of a group. We want them to be a part of a team. But yet when they win, we're quick to say, well, it wasn't your team, so your championship is devalued. You wrote some coattails. It makes no sense. <laughs> yeah. Can't have it both ways. Right? So we can't sit here and say, well, whose team it is. The fact of the matter is they both have different personalities, and they can drive the team in their respective ways. And the key is understanding for the rest of the team to understand what personality does what and in what areas of the game can that personality best benefit us you know and that's it's no different than with me and Shaq well that's what Jalen thinks they can win the title now you that's your pick right I think with their moves with all things equal everyone obviously healthy because of what you just mentioned about Russell Westbrook KD has an opportunity now not to play every night mm -hmm. because Phoenix basically mortgaged what I felt like was an opportunity to get to a spot or by higher. trading their yeah. two point, point right. guards. So now KD doesn't have to go as hard these last 20 or so games. Right. Russell can carry the load. He can miss games. Right. But once they get into the playoffs, with the moves they made, I think they're the favorite. I still, my one thing that I worry about with them, so many young guys that haven't really been in a big spot in a big game. And if you remember, like, take, for example, the 2008 Celtics. Mm -hmm. Sorry. No. Uh, Get Eddie used to the Celtic right Eddie House, assist. James Posey, mm -hmm. P.J. Brown. Mm -hmm. Those guys had been there, and it's like, Enos Cantor, Deion Waiters. These are guys that have never really played in a big game. And then you're trusting these guys at some point during the playoffs. But who has outside of San Antonio? True. Good point. All right, who we got to go to break, and then we're going to talk about your Mr. documentary. Serge Ibaka's got experience. That's three. We're going to break. <laughs> you're ruining my break. Kobe's got a new documentary coming out. We're going to talk about it right after the break. There's a kid named Victor. Approached me during lunch and said, I hear you can play basketball, and you know, I'm the man here, so what's on? I was upset that I had moved from Italy, left all my friends. I had all this resentment and anger inside of me that I hadn't really let out. And so I demolished this poor kid. And that feeling of playing with that rage was new to me, but I loved it. <laughs> That's from uh, Kobe's new documentary, Muse, February 28th, Showtime. I thought it was fascinating. Uh, 
that part in particular, I, I don't think people, you know, you've been in the league for since 96. I don't think people even remember the story of how you grew up. And I, that was one of the parts I was like, oh, yeah, this guy grew up in Italy. Right. And then he got dropped back in America. Right. And, you know, Gladwell has a book called Outliers, which talks about all these people that achieve different things because of weird circumstances, basically. Mm -hmm. Let's say you grew up conventionally. Let's say you grew up in Detroit like Jalen. Right. What does your career look like? Well, it, I don't know what my career would look like, but emotionally... Uh, be in a different place, right? Because for me, growing up in isolation turned out to be a great strength for me, but it also turned out to be a weakness too and things that I kind of had to navigate through as my career went on. Because when you become used to solving issues and dealing with issues on your own, you're very reluctant to surround yourself with people that are willing to help. Right. Or to even ask for help. Hence is the reason why I'm more comfortable taking the shot to win the game with two people on me versus kicking it to somebody in the corner. Right, so all those things play a part in it, right, into my development. But and you grew up the exact opposite way, basically. You were all people around you at all time. You like you're yeah. setting people up. You're the point guard. Yeah, I was a. Uh, it takes a village to raise a child type mm -hmm. of upbringing. But to be successful, you have to be able to persevere, and so people see your success now. But you've had to overcome some obstacles. Right. It's tough to be in another country, learning multiple languages, and then trying to fit in as a youth. Right. in the United States. So talk about yeah. that person. Well, it was tough because, you know, um, Italian was really my first language. And so now to move back at the age of 13 in, 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 in middle school and being completely different um, was, uh, was uncomfortable to say the least, man. You know, I had a hard time reading, had a hard, hard time spelling and kind of getting adjusted to the culture. Um, but basketball was my refuge, man. It was my escape. And, uh, and I didn't realize I had those feelings inside of me of leaving my friends and coming back to this environment. Um, I didn't realize I had that in there. Right. You know, and until you know, I was challenged, and then it was like, oh. When did you know I'm, no one is going to outwork me? I never looked at it as work. I didn't realize it was work until my first year in the NBA. When I came around, I was surrounded by um, other professionals. And I thought basketball was going to be everything to them, and it wasn't. And I was like, oh, this is different. No, I, I thought everybody was, like, obsessive about the game, like me. It was like, no, oh, okay, so that's hard work. Okay, I get it now. One of the themes of the documentary is the court was, like, your refuge. And no matter what was going on in your life, you had this. Mm -hmm. And if things were tough, you went there. And when, you know, at one point you were talking about how you hear everything in the crowd. Mm -hmm. And if the crowd's yelling stuff at you, you heard it, and you almost had to create this alternative character. Right. To deal with it, but does that is that even the case now? Like you look at you're wearing this sling on your right. arm, you right. can't go to the basketball court. You don't have the refuge. Right. But as soon as that thing comes off, do you just go back there and start shooting again? Well, the the, the challenge now becomes you know, it, there's a um, uh, a finality to the game, right? Where you, that can't be my refuge forever. Right? It becomes really scary. Like all right, now so where does that go? <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. You know what do you what do you evolve into to be able to have an area where you can create a way where you can express yourself and let those emotions out because I can't play basketball forever, right? So that becomes the challenge now. So for you, it was an edit bay with a director and a bunch of editors and a bunch of people, and you were man, in there for like five straight was, months, right? Man, it was it was it's just storytelling. You know, it's something I've always enjoyed doing, like all my commercials and. Um, um, the products that we create over at Nike and the stories that go around them, you know, I was, it starts with me and who I am and where I'm at. And then from that, I create the story. And this is what I love to do. So if I'm going to make a film, I'm going to do a documentary, I'm going to... You're going all in. I'm going all in. Yeah. I'm going all in. It's going to be like a book. It's just no different than me writing a book. But the only difference is I'm creating it through a film. And unfortunately for you, your last couple of seasons ended in injury. So when you're back healthy, and you finally decide, you know what, this may be it. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like you want to do a Derek Jeter and have a farewell tour? Or is it going to be, I'm just going to decide after the 82nd game or after the playoffs? And we should mention, you, there was an erroneous report that you're retiring next oh, season, yeah. which is not true. Yeah, yeah, no, it's not true. Now, it's not true. It's yeah, they, play a lot, they pay a lot of money to play basketball. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, I, I, I'm just going to play. I'm just going to play. I mean, it wouldn't be true to who I've been my entire career. To, to do plan. a fare farewell tour. And first of all, I'd feel weird, you know, to have these celebrations. I gotta say, I can't imagine I can't... you, like, being honored before a game. Like, 
Here's a rocking chair we made you come. I remember yeah. that happened to Dr. J, and it was kind of a bummer. Yeah. No, I, I'd much rather them treat me the way that they've been treating me my entire career. Like, that's, you know, that's a sign of respect to me. One of the best parts of the documentary is at the end, the doctor's telling you about your shoulder. Yeah. And you did a really smart filmmaking thing. You faded away the sound of the doctor because your reaction, you were so bummed out. Like, right. you were just, you could see the life sink from your body. And then the quote that you said after was, at what point are you holding on to something that's not there? Right. You've been through this already. You, you totally, you don't even know if you really ever hit that point. You felt like you could keep playing after you retired. Because I'm not one of the top five or ten players of all time. I can't choose when it's over. Right. They tell me when it's over. He's going to tell the Lakers <laughs> when he's done. But, I mean, that, that's a really interesting point, though, is because when do you know? Right? It's like when you stand at half court, right? We're all taking half court shots, right? Just kind of goofing around. Absolutely. Right? Get that fine money. You make one, right? Let me see if I can make another one. Make another one. Yeah. Let me see if I can make another one. Right? And then you miss. It's like, well, I can't end on a miss. Right? So let me keep going. Right? So you make one. It's like, I wonder if I can make another one. Right? And it goes on and on and on. The cycle just repeats itself. So at what point do you say enough is enough? It's time to walk away from this thing. Right? I don't know if that moment ever truly exists. It has to be, you, have, you kind of have to feel it inside of yourself and say, you know what, I'm ready to move on and do something else. Well, Jalen makes a great point, though. Most people, that choice is made for them. Mm -hmm. And when you get to your level, and I saw it happen with Larry Bird in the early 90s with the Celtics, where he's playing with this 15-pound back brace. Right. He was still putting up 20 and 9 and 6, but he could barely move, and they would have kept paying him to come back. Right. He was still selling tickets. We still loved him, but he made the choice to go away. Right. You know? right. I mean, listen, it, and it's, a, it's a good issue to have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a good issue to have. But Especially I, with the cap going up. Yeah, I mean, it is what it is, man. But, yeah, I, you know, I understand that um, no matter when that time comes, I understand that a year from that moment, I'm going to want to play again, right? Because you're going to miss it. And uh, I accept that. As a student of the game, how important is it to remain a Laker, to keep your, your legendary status intact, have a statue in front of the Staples Center, yeah. all of the great things that they've done for some of their all-time greats? No, it's... it's of utmost importance. Like, I, I mean, I was such a diehard fan, Laker fan growing up, man. And just my personality, like, it would, for me to ask for a trade or to go play someplace else to try to chase a championship, that's not me, man. That's not being, that's not what my career has been about. That's not who I am, man. I mean, I stay with it. You know, stuff that I've been through in my life and been through in my career, I mean, if it's taught me anything, it's the fact that You'll have good moments, you have bad moments, you have great moments, you have horrible moments. You just keep going through all of them, and then things work themselves out. Did, uh, like last year, there was a story about the Knicks. Lakers weren't doing well. Phil, Phil Jackson's taking over the Knicks. They're possibly headed toward the playoffs or trying to get there. And it was like, oh, Kobe, well, but, and right. you squashed that in like five it's seconds. Ne it's never going to happen. <laughs> yeah. I'm never going to. Does that record mean anything to you? Like, I think you have a chance to be most years anyone ever spent with the same team that drafted him. I think you might even already be there. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, next year it'll be 20. Right. So, um, I've honestly just been very fortunate to be with a great organization. But I also understand that you have to take the good with the bad, man. You're the captain of the ship. You go down with the ship. <laughs> you know, and the ship's going down. You don't jump off and swim to another one. And, and, and is that a reference to a lot of players now going to team up with other all-star caliber players to try to achieve the championship dream? Title chasing, yeah, I they mean, call it. I mean, you know, it, it just depends on what your philosophy is. Like, I'm not sitting here saying my philosophy is the right way, right? It's my way. This is how I choose to do it. You know, and some people may agree with it, some people may not, you know. Um, is it hurting me right now? Yeah, it is. Is being that stubborn hurting me right now? Yeah, it <laughs> is, right? I could be playing someplace else, getting ready, you know what I mean? Um, but it's just who I am, so. Well, let's talk about somebody who is uh, at the beginning of his career. Remember, Brown has our Subway fresh cake. My name is Rembert Brown, and I'm a Hawks fan. More importantly, I'm the president of Grantland's Dennis Schroeder Fan Club. Schroeder at the buzzer. Oh, oh, oh. He gave it to Larry Bird. He turned and headed up he the floor. He knew that was good. This club exists because he is the most interesting man in the NBA. Does he have a blonde streak in his hair that makes him look like a comic book character? Of course he does. Does he have the build of a high-end runway model? Absolutely. 
Is he from Germany, and does his name have an umlaut in it? Yes and yes. And does he love getting his shot blocked by the gigantic men of the NBA? Even more than he loves umlauts. But Dennis, he never gives up. He's fearless, he's fast, he can drive and dish, he can hit the three. But most importantly, he has an umlaut in his name, blonde in his hair, and might be 90 pounds, which is why he's easily the most interesting man in the NBA. All right, welcome to Keep It 100. This is the part of the show where Kobe has to stand in the corner where we run a play for Jalen. <laughs> Picture that. You're, you're, you're for spacing right hey, now. Hey, man, you miss it, I get the rebound, kick it back. Go, Jalen. It's time for me to keep it 100. With me, that's who, and here's why. I'm not proud to say this, Kobe Bean Bryant, at all. But I'm not a future Hall of Famer. I'm not a five-time champ. I'm not one of the greatest players to ever do it. I did not want you to get injured, but I did want you to get hurt just for that series. Because I like championship rings. I like parades. I like all of the glory that comes with being great. I can't change my number from 8 to 24, go from a high top fade to a crispy Caesar. So to Kobe Bean Bryant, my apologies. Apologies accepted. He can, but apologies deep down, accepted. he kind of liked it. Because he would have. You like the overcompetitiveness. Because here's the thing. He's the kind of guy that if he gets into a fight, he'll find a way to win the fight. Okay. I'll be losing the fight, and I'll go get a bottle. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's what I did. <laughs> no, nah, man, listen. I, I re honestly, I remember that, and I, I hadn't forgot about it. And I was waiting on my revenge. Yes. And when I. Oh. Toronto, I, mean, dun, dun, I, I was dun, dun, like, dun. I swear, I was like, <laughs> yes, I'm not, I don't know if it was on purpose, I don't know if it was accidental, but it did happen, and I want revenge, and I, I was able to. Oh, you put the smack down. <laughs> you sure did. But Jalen Bain's the coach. He but, said they should double team. But this is what I always say about that game. Please pay attention to this, because they show it a million times. There was no chest thumping. There was no trash talking. It was almost like, I'm serious. Like, it was a man amongst boys. He was in such a zone. He never did this. He never pumped his chest out at all. And that's the focus and the concentration I think a lot of young players mm -hmm. miss because they're trying to get the oohs and ahs from the yeah. crowd. It's hard. It's hard to get to that place. It's very, very difficult to get to that place. But once you get there, then it becomes a matter of understanding that you're there, you accept that you're there, and you don't try to realize that you're there. It's, it's, it's a very tough balance because any moment can take you out of that zone kind of take you out of that flow, you know, and where nothing else matters. Nothing else is important other than what I'm doing at this moment in time. And uh, it's a beautiful feeling. Can we go back to the 2000 finals, which was a way closer series than I think people remember? Game six, yeah. you're up three, where we have it. Uh, like 20 seconds left. Biggest play. No, uh -oh. Ralph! Uh-oh, somebody got bailed out. Call those superstar calls. We need another. Look, the legend got upset at yeah, that call. <laughs> you made the legend upset. That's a foul, though. All right, we got one more angle. Hold on. Let's see. They caught it on Crozier. That's a foul. Well, Jalen's been talking about this call for <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I don't know 15 why. 15 years. I don't know why. I mean, you know, he should have been, been yelling at Austin because he was fundamentally unsound. I mean, you don't come and bail a player out in that type of situation. You just go straight up and let him take that shot and, and live with it. Do you want to know the But they made plenty of mistakes on that, though. Like, they, they all came to me. If that I had angle. missed a shot, Shaq would have got the rebound and dunked it anyway. Yep. So there was a lot of fundamentally incorrect things that they did in that sequence. All right, that might all make sense, but do you want to know the conversations we have? They call traveling or whatever. Now they have the ball down three. They run the play for Reggie. You yeah. shade two guys over. Yeah. Jalen pops up the thing. You guys don't get over in time. He makes a three overtime. He thinks about this all the time. And then and we, I then, then we go into job. overtime and win the game in overtime. No, he doesn't. <laughs> That's fun. not part of his <laughs> fantasy <laughs> dream. No, then we're doing a, a parade in Indianapolis. <laughs> Man, listen, Shaq was on a mission that year. Yes, he was. You know, he I was on like a mission Wilt. that year. I mean, there was no way. Very quickly, what was 2001, 2000, 2002, which somehow I did in the wrong order. What was the closest you came to losing during those three years? Was it that series or was it Sacramento 2002 or Portland 2000? Sa Sacramento series, I, I, don't, I still don't know how we beat that team. I mean, they were kicking our butt. I mean, every game, they started out up 20. I mean, it was, right. it was insane. And the fact that we were able to muscle through that. And I think they weren't used to being in pressing situations because on game seven, it was really Because they started airballing threes. Right. The it got, it, you know, it kind of felt the pressure. Yeah. Right? And we were used to it. We'd been there. We took advantage of it.
All right, we're, we'll be back. More with Jaywin and Kobe coming right up. So me not being able to perform because of my Achilles and old age, I drew a lot of inspiration from the fact that Beethoven was not supposed to compose the Ninth Symphony while being legally deaf. I would say that not being able to hear and compose the Ninth Symphony is probably a bigger challenge than playing basketball on one and a half legs. That's from Kobe's documentary, February 28th, Showtime, Muse, it's called. I want to talk about leadership, because I think this is a topic that you and I have talked a couple times about it, mm -hmm. that you're kind of just fascinated by. And it drifted into this doc, especially um, you were talking about in 2008, um, your team got bullied in the finals, mm -hmm. and you felt like you weren't tough enough, and you blamed yourself partly because you thought you kind of betrayed who you were, right. and you were too nice, and you were too backslappy, right. Right. and you and you flipped the switch on for those next two years, right. and you thought the team assumed your personality. Mm -hmm. Is that a storyline that just benefits you, or is that like did did these guys really assume your personality? No, they what what had what had to happen is they had to take ownership of their own journeys, right? So what does that mean? So that means taking things, using things in your life that that are scars, using those moments as a weapon, right? Using those as, you know, using basketball as kind of like a vehicle through which to express yourself, right? So it doesn't, so at that moment, for us to face the Celtics again, it's not about the Celtics. It's not about your opponent, it's about you. Mm. It's about you taking your inner struggles and channeling that through the game, right? As a, as a, as a, as a way to, to unleash. Right? So now it became a matter of how do I express that to them? How do I get them to that point where they figure this out for themselves? Because I can't say, hey, listen, I need you to play harder. So what'd you I do? You... Well, I had to share my story. I had to open up to them and let them know I've dealt with things. This is the things that I use. This is how I go about focus. This is how I deal with adversity. This is how I deal with you know, arguing with my wife the day of the game and showing up to the game and still having that focus to be able to play. Like, I used those things to open up with them. And then in turn, they were able to, um, um, to, 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 to take those stories and, and make them their own. Does that make sense to you? It does, because it's about perseverance. And I use this example a lot. Um, Tiger Woods, who I'm a fan of, he hit a lot of adversity. Mm -hmm. And he hasn't won a major since. He hasn't been competitive at all. You had adversity, mm -hmm. it made you better. It mm -hmm. made you more disciplined. It made you more focused. Mm -hmm. Talk about the difference. Well, to be completely honest, I mean, I, I, I had a moment there where I didn't want to play either, right? And, you know, Vanessa, who's, who's every bit as competitive as I am, said, no, you're going to play. This is what you do. You're going to play, and you're going to go out there, and you're going to play well, and you're going to dominate. Um, and that's what I did. So me having that support at home, really would propelled me to have that season. See, Ron Artest, now Metal World Peace, would say your season turned when he walked in to you when you were taking a shower. <laughs> <laughs> Game 6 of 2008 yeah. finals. Yeah. Uh, one thing I noticed with the doc, and I got to bring it up, because it's told from your point of view, and mm -hmm. you'd actually said you'd done it the traditional way with a bunch of different interviews, and you decided, you know what, I'm doing it my way, which is actually kind of funny, because you that was a little bit how you played, too, where right. it's like, I'm taking over. Just control what you can control. This. Yeah. <laughs> But Phil Jackson's like barely mentioned in the doc. Yeah. And it made me think like, are these guys on good terms? Yeah. Why, are you conspicuously leaving him yeah. out? What was the story but there? But see, the beautiful thing about it is that he's present throughout the entire doc. Because the philosophies that you hear throughout the entire documentary are philosophies that I learned from him. Leadership, is like those what? are things I learned from him. Being present, being in the moment, controlling what you can control, right? Um, that's all him. The reason why he doesn't have a significant presence in the documentary is because I'd be doing it a serious injustice to just mention him here. Right. That requires a more flushed out, it requires its own chapter. And just by the arc of the film and dealing with the trajectory of the Achilles injury and finding stories that, that have a common thread with that, um, having a chapter solely based on Phil did not make sense for that. Uh, but the time will come where I will do uh, uh, the correct chapter Phil on thing? that. Because it's interesting, because, like, Jalen has Larry, and 
you've said it a million times, like you owe that one giant contract you got and, and the big when your career took off to things that you learned from him. And you, you will call him every day if he would accept your call. It doesn't seem like you talk to Phil that much, do you? Or oh, do you I talk and to we him. Don't know? I talk to him a lot. How often? Actually. See, last time I spoke to Phil was probably about two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. We have breakfast every now and then when he's out here. We have breakfast. breakfast so you have now. a good relationship. It's great. Huh. Okay. Great. What do you say when you see Phil and Derek dealing with, they're dealing with in New York, B. Shaw dealing with what he's dealing with, and with the Nuggets, mm -hmm. and you guys had so much success together, five championships. Mm -hmm. What is your advice? No, they'll figure it out. It's a process. I mean, that's what Phil always taught us, and it's a process. And you go through these things, but these things have a way of working themselves out. You know, you pay attention to every little detail. You look at the, you know, little nuances of things and uh, the emotion behind these things. And, you know, Phil was always a big proponent, but proponent of understanding why things happen. All right, so a lot of things are going to be said surrounding the triangle because Phil made it, you know, legendary. Mm. But... Players nowadays don't dominate the boxes and elbows. Mm -hmm. You and MJ are two of the best at doing that. That's scoring from the elbow and posting up. Mm -hmm. The stat nerds don't like those plays anymore. Absolutely. So mm -hmm. do you feel like that can still be effective in today's game? Well, it is effective. All you have to do is watch the Spurs. You know, the Spurs had a much different system when we were playing them in 2000 and 2001. It was a different system. It, yep. was, it was two in. You know, three out. Yep, they beat right? you with the defense. But they, they see beat. us how we played and how we flowed in the triangle system. And Pop um, changed the system up. So now what you see the Spurs run, you see a lot of triangle stuff, man. You see a lot of it. A lot of the flexibility, the ball movement, changing sides of the floor. A lot of it has triangle elements to it. So, you know, uh, you know Phil's influence on the game is, is more present than people think. At the same time, I mean, do you guys like where basketball is going? Because I can't decide. Because, like, the All-Star game had 133s or something. You watch right. the NBA games now and the Curry-Thompson strategy, right. corner threes. I mean, it's certainly more efficient. Um, do you think this is just where basketball's headed and that's it? Or do you see an alternative? No, it, it'll, it'll evolve. Basketball, it always evolves. Right? Back in the day, it was like the game's ugly because it's so, you know, it's, it's brute force. Right? Ball, There's yeah. always something, right? Yeah. The game should be prettier. It should be more up-tempo. Now it is. Now, you know, now it's too much. Right, but the fact is the game will evolve, it will change, and then we'll be wanting the game to be more like the way it is today. What do you feel about terms being thrown out there in a league that we all love? Resting healthy players, tanking, shutting it Jaylen down. Jalen hates the known play in 82 games, right, rest right. all the time. Have thing. we seen the last of a great player playing 30 straight games without needing rest? Uh, maybe. Maybe, wow. and, you know, it's uh... I'm sorry, Jalen. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's funny, it's, it's such a... Wow, wow. wow. Yeah, it's such a, such a different... Such a different era. Um, you know, and... Uh, you don't like it, I know you don't like <laughs> no, it. No, I don't, and I'm, I'm, like I'm it. old school about it. And I'm old school about it, but, I, but, but in thinking why that happens, I mean, I think all the, the advances that we made in technology and health and things like that bring bring certain injury injuries to the forefront uh, it makes players and the training staff pay attention to certain injuries the over diagnosing that, it. that yeah. 20 years ago it was like yeah, all right you know rub some spit on that thing go out right. and play quickly what's the best thing from 2015 that you wish you had had in 2002 technology the, advanced stats anything uh, illegal deed the old illegal defense rules yes indeed you beat you can't, a guy you can't bell player you can't bell players out man yep all right make players man up and play well, when we, help exactly. all the time. we can play zone. Yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> SOS defense. We're going to do mailbags with uh, Kobe and Jalen coming up. But first, here's Kirk Goldsberry talking about the evolution of one of the best new players in the league, Anthony Davis. Anthony Davis is in the middle of a truly remarkable season. He may end the year leading the NBA in both points and field goal percentage inside of the three-point line. That's incredible, but how is he doing it? To understand this breakout year, you have to understand where he came from. When he entered the league just over two years ago, we all knew that Davis would be a beast in the paint. But back then, he couldn't shoot it. Wow. No iron at all on Anthony Davis's shot. Oh, that was all the way down to top guy. Yeah, he shoots like he's wishing the ball in the hole. Tough shooting night for Anthony so far. He made only 33% of his mid-range shots as a rookie. 
that's bad. Those are Josh Smith numbers. In fact, out of 94 players that attempted at least 250 mid-range shots that year, Davis ranked 92nd in efficiency. That's terrible. But since then, Davis has worked tirelessly to change his shooting mechanic. He's changed the very way he releases his shot. He used to release the ball in front of his face, which partially blocked his view of the target. Now, he has a much more mature shot, like Dirk Nowitzki or LaMarcus Aldridge, with the ball raised over his head, up above his ear. This helps him see the hoop better, and it makes it harder for defenders to block his shot. The change has worked. This year, he's making 45% of those mid-range shots, which is way above league average. That's a massive improvement for just two seasons. Davis comes high to get it. Hand off to Evans. Back to Anthony. Oh, that's soft touch. His favorite jumper is now in the tactically vital pick-and-pop area right above the free throw line. But here's the thing. Now that defenders have to creep up to defend this jumper, like Aaron Baines does here, it's suddenly easier for Davis to use his dribble to attack the basket. Those improvements as a shooter have opened up the whole floor for him. So when we talk about Anthony Davis, we're talking about a guy that has gone from Josh Smith level efficiency to Kevin Durant level efficiency in just two years time. And he's only 21. Let me say that again, he's only 21 years old. It's no exaggeration to say that the sky is the limit for young Anthony Davis. The Gr Mailbag is brought to you by the U.S. Postal Service. Need to return a package? We'll return it for you. Visit usps.com. All right, welcome to Mail Time. We're bringing you in this one, too. Got some right. mailbag questions. What would you do differently about being Dwight Howard's teammate? Zero. Absolutely zero. Nothing? Nothing. Okay. It ain't my fault. Nothing. Did I do that? Nothing, nothing. You know, listen, I, I I learned how to be a leader by watching Magic, Bird, Michael, and those guys. They're, they're relentless. They're ruthless. And, you know, for me to give the keys of this kingdom to the next leader that's going to lead this Laker organization for generations to come has to have that same DNA. And I, Sink I, or I swim. Can't, yeah, I can't be apologetic about it. No that. regrets. Okay. Uh, Jalen, the Lakers claim they won 16 titles. Five of those titles happened in Minneapolis. Why did the L.A. Laker fans count those five titles? I told you it's going to be multiple Celtic references. No, that's just They get one a little bit closer. They I got know, 16 my, my 17 now. happened in they Boston. They have 17. Kobe, you know this. what this is all about. Sure. A Laker sure. versus Celtic thing. Of course they count. Yeah. So should Oklahoma City count the Seattle title from yeah. 1979? Well, they do, actually. You keep the history. Yeah. You I don't what's in the record either. books. <laughs> all right. Uh, Kobe, you only won one MVP award. Yeah. Why? Well, because the media votes on it. Oh, you flipped it on me. <laughs> Boom. I Message. Voted, I didn't have a vote in 2006, but I thought 2006, you should win. Yeah, I mean, listen. It's, you don't it's, care. Uh, no, I, I, I don't. I mean, it was never a mission of mine to win a bunch of MVPs. It was to win a lot of championships. Um, but that being said, does it bother me? Yeah, it bothers me. Of course it bothers me. At least you won more finals MVPs. Right. I mean, I, you know, that's the thing that matters the most is winning those things. Okay. But you do want to win as many as you can. So. Shaq and, Shaq and uh, Kobe won three titles. How many should they have won, Jalen? Wow. Based on what we discussed earlier as someone that was covering and playing against that team, Magic and Kareem have five. Mm -hmm. Yes. I wanted to see them at least get five and then see if they could go for more. But five is the minimum I'm going for. I will say, in the summer of 2000, I would have put the over-under at six and a half. And I, I specifically remember thinking, because the Celtics, we had Antoine and Paul. I'm thinking, we're looking pretty good. Yeah. We got some picks coming. And then the, after 2000, I was like, oh, my God, the decade's yeah. over. Like, yeah. did you feel that way in 2000? Well, it, it became very hard for us around 2004 when, you know, we, we tried to break up the team and went with the superstar route and stuff like that. It became very difficult because we had a system of players that understood how to play with each other. Yeah. And so now we had to drastically change that and try to reboot things. It became, became complicated. But, I mean, we could have could have won five, could have won six. Speaking of that 4 team. You're stepping on the mailbag segment. I know, but this is really <laughs> interesting, and he has an injury to his shoulder. Carl Malone has an issue with you right now. You need a little help with some bodyguard work? Man, I don't deal with trivial things. <laughs> uh, next question. Is it true 
that you squashed your own trade in Detroit in 2007. That is true. To Detroit? That is true. Sorry, Jalen. That is true. Do we know what the trade was and who was in it? I'm assuming Rip Hamilton was in it. That is correct. Is Was Tayshaun Prince in it? That is also correct. And a lot of draft picks. That is also correct. And they laid it out to you and they said, you can go to Detroit, here's That's your right. team. And I said, I gave you a list of teams that I'm comfortable being traded to. That was one of them. So no. So who was on the list? Not Detroit. Chicago. <laughs> Chicago. Chicago was Chicago my, came close. my number one choice for okay. destination. All right, last question. Jalen, what's your best piece of advice for dads wow. who might have teenage daughters coming up? Like now, that's the most Kobe. important question. Yes, yeah. indeed. I have an awesome daughter that's an honor roll student and plays volleyball, but you're not cool anymore. Are you cool to your kids? Nope. <laughs> I'm still cool to my kids. You can't so that's dance. You can't on me. I'm daddy dork. 100%, man. The whole world like, there's Kobe. Man, nothing. Like, oh, all right, oh. nothing I can do. That's all the time we got. Thank you, Kobe Bryant. Check out Kobe's documentary airing on Showtime on February 28th. Thanks for watching. Thanks for doing this, Kobe. Really it, appreciate it. Sure it's fun. Like you got a future in this thing. Nah, I don't know about that. <laughs>